Welcome to the Martin E. Siegel Theatre Centre here at the Graduate Centre CUNY and to Prelude 21, uh, Start Making Sense. Um, it is our annual um, theatre and performance festival celebrating the work of New York theatre artists and ensembles and it's hard enough in normal times to create work for the stage and for uh, spaces inside and outside but in the time of Corona we all are faced with exceptional challenges and uh, we are here to celebrate again the extraordinary achievements that come out of the New York theatre community. It is time, I think, and we feel, to start making sense to ask uh, questions. Why are we making theatre? But also how are we producing it? And for whom? And uh, this is a great investigation again into the um, mechanics uh, of making art uh, in New York City and we also invited uh, theater ensembles from around the US from Detroit and Cincinnati, St. Louis and uh, Philadelphia, uh, New Orleans um, to join us and um, this will be an extraordinary look into uh, what is on the minds of artists right now. We also have uh, many panel discussions. Uh, we have uh, an award which we're giving out uh, to honor uh, uh, outstanding members of the New York theater community, so I would like to all of you to uh, join in and uh, get an insight of what uh, is happening. My mic on now? Does it work? So, welcome everybody here at the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, the Graduate Center, CUNY in Midtown Manhattan. I was just saying it's getting already dark. It's uh, five o'clock and uh, it's no longer um, a bright sky. So, we're slowly entering in the twilight zone. And uh, as we are perhaps a little bit in this time of COVID, where uh, we are in between COVID and non COVID or still COVID, we don't really know where we are, where we are going. And um, this is the last panel, actually. The festival is over tonight. We have a presentation, um, um, a, a last presentation at 7 o'clock um, uh, tonight. But this is the last panel, and it's a very important one, I feel. It's uh, looking at why we do not have a global big theater festival in New York City in the summer a festival like Avignon Festival, like uh, the Edinburgh Festival, the Theater der Welt uh, festivals of Wiener Festwochen. Um, so um, we feel it's something of importance, it's of significance to have a global exchange. And um, and so we are looking at if something like this could happen, if we could build this coalition in this time after Corona, and perhaps there is a chance to rethink. We learned that the Avignon Festival started after World War II, the Edinburgh Festival started after World War II, the Ruhr Festival in started after a world war ii so perhaps there is something of a rejuvenation the celebration of the city and life but every city needs its own festival um, what do people really want and maybe there are reasons there has never been a big festival in new york because it's a year-long festival anyway so um with us we have great uh, uh, leaders of um, uh, um cultural institutions all great thinkers and artists um, um, and so we just want to listen to the ideas. They are prelude curators, but also outside. And um, so we have with us Elena, David, uh, Krista, Niall, and Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you really for joining. My name is uh, Frank Henschke. I'm here at the Siegel Center, where we normally bridge academia and professional theater, international and American theater. But we feel perhaps a, a time now we go a little bit outside of our place. This was everybody advised us and look at the city and the public spaces and festivals, how we can make a meaningful contribution after all we are this uh, at the city university. I would like to take the moment to acknowledge the Lenape people upon whose land we are gathered in today and also the airwaves in a way. And we do pay respect to the Lenape people and ancestors past, present, and also to the future. So this is uh, important to us. So welcome everybody, and maybe we just go uh, clockwise um, and start with um, 
um, Elizabeth, who is maybe here with us, um, Elizabeth, who, on the last minute, Woody King um, has a shoot today from the Federal Theater. She's just started running the great new Federal Theater in New York City with that long history. But she also speaks for the theater, for the Coalition of Colors Theaters of the Color. It's like uh, over 50 now. They got together, got also a big support from the city, a big shot in the arm. Um, so um, Elizabeth, tell us a little bit about you and your work. Hello, I'm Elizabeth Van Dyke, and thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure to be included in this illustrious group of artists. Uh, I am currently the producing artistic director of Woody King Jr.'s New Federal Theater. Uh, I feel that I am honoring our legacy and building a bridge for the future. And I am uh, told representing the Coalition of Theaters of Colors, which was founded several years ago, about 13, 20, 15 years ago, um, to face the inequity in funding for theaters of color. And so uh, initially it was 13 original members, and now it has uh, grown to over 52. Uh, and it's wonderful. And I'm, I'm just happy to be here. That's it in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you really, uh, the city listened to all of you, and I think Jimmy van Bremer, the great, you know, uh, councilman or speaker at the time, majority whip, who helped, supported you guys and everybody, it's a great support of the arts, um, and helped to you to be there. Niall, tell us a little bit about you. Hi, Frank, um, and hello, everyone. I'm really grateful to be here. My name is Niall Harris. Um, I'm calling in from Crown Heights, Brooklyn, New York. Um, I'm really excited to be on this panel. I feel like I'm unique that I'm not representing an institution here this afternoon or this early evening, but I am an independent artist and a curator and I'm one of the curators of the Prelude um, Festival this season as a part of the chain curation, um, which has been really, really exciting um, and a really wonderful new way of bringing in new voices into the theater space. Um, and I'm really excited to be with you all here today to vision about what we might want the future of a festival in New York City to look like. Thank you. Kristen. Hi, uh, I'm Kristen Martin. I'm the founding artistic director of HERE Art Center and also uh, co-founding director of the Prototype Festival. Um, I'm interested in contemporary, relevant, socially um, immediate work um, in all disciplines, theater, music, dance, puppetry, media, arts. Um, HERE uh, has been around almost 30 years and we do all kinds of stuff. Um, we support artists from inception through work in progress workshop and fully produce their work and help launch it on tour. We have guests in our space. We're a hybrid organization. We're a producer, a presenter, and a venue. Um, and Prototype is an opera and music theater festival of contemporary work. Um, it goes all around the city. Here is the smallest venue, and we usually work with five or six other venues, and I co-produce that festival with Beth Morrison Projects. So I'll just start there. Great. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Elena. Hi everyone, and great, uh, great to be here. I am executive and artistic director of PS21, Performance Spaces for the 21st Century. It's a new venue in the Hudson Valley, two hours north of New York City. The closest town to us is Hudson, New York, about 15 minutes. We are um, a theater on two stages. One of the stages is um, uh, an open air pavilion roof covered theater. And a smaller stage, which is a black box for about 120 seats. And we are on 100 acres of apple orchards and um, rolling hills and meadows that we own in the theater. And um, the reason you may not have heard of PS21 because it's, a, it, it's kind of an emblematic also case of US philanthropy where it was built singularly by one person out of her checkbook. And um, it just shows you how U.S. really is the country where you can give away that much money. And you can either build a shed or you can build a small PS21, which is truly magnificent, state-of-the-art, LED lights, geothermal, and allows the most sophisticated creation in multidisciplinary work. And that's actually what we indeed are very interested in, the kind of work that pushes the boundary of form that really 
would bring you to a, a concept to the very different conceptions of what theater can be, how audience can experience it. During the last two years, we uh, ran both seasons live. The first year that, and I, I'm the first executive director of the space, we reimagined the season, ran it in 2020, both live and live streamed. And then in 2021, we launched full scale and presented um, a variety of productions from, interna from International Contemporary Circus. We were one of the few presenters who brought the National Circus to the US and presented several premieres um, to contemporary opera. I raised the entire budget for all of our salaries. We have a tiny staff. Um, our season was from May through September, and I raised the budget both for administration and for all of programming. I also program, and yeah. you will be more than welcome when we launch the next iteration. Good, and you know, and you have some ideas what a festival could be, what's missing, or if we have a how to be David. Hi, I'm David Bruin, uh, one of the curators of this year's Prelude Festival, along with Niall. I'm also the executive artistic director at Celebration Barn Theater, which is a theater center in Western Maine dedicated to physical theater, devising, clown, uh, some circus, and uh, performer-generated work. We have 11 acres, so a, a small percentage of what Elena has, but we do have apple orchards on the property. So uh, <laughs> if you're ever in Western Maine, please come by and let me know. Fantastic. Yo, really, first of all, thank you all um, for joining us. So it's a group, it's a mixture of, uh, of prelude curators and uh, people um, like Elizabeth and Elena, where we think highly of their work and the institutions. And we just want to hear, so we are listening. Um, the Siegel Center, we are really thinking of getting involved or perhaps founding a, a, something like a festival, a global festival outside, perhaps, in the public spaces. But um, we need to listen. We need to want to know what our colleagues and friends think and reflect warnings they have or some enthusiasm what's there. New York City is a city of artists. I think there is no city in the US where so many artists work so successfully in so, so many disciplines. Most probably no city in the Americas has so many artists among their uh, population everywhere in all the five boroughs actually, and not just uh, as it used to be. People look at it in Manhattan, and it's so diverse. Um, I think we have 150 languages in New York City. White uh, population is actually now in the minority. It's not really reflected on the stages, on the stories we hear and see. And a public space is not fully used as perhaps it was in the 70s. We just had a, a talk yesterday about theater in the 70s, and they talked about the time in the New York City at similar problems when they saw there would be the end of theater, the end of the city, it will have to shut down. But performing arts were alive and people went outside. A lot of it actually happened in public spaces and there were small festivals or people touring the neighborhoods in small mobiles, jazz mobiles and uh, Shakespeare mobiles. And um, so perhaps it's a time to reconnect and reinvent. So, um, I would like to hear from you a little bit about the work of your institution and what, if someone says, join us or, or what can we learn from you for a festival, also a global one where we present work from here, but also from our uh, colleagues and brothers and sisters from around the world, how would it look like? We do know problems are global problems, issues are global issues, climate change, uh, racism, sexism, homophobia, fascism. Um, um, the uh, um, limited access to education, to arts, uh, to healthcare, and um, and so we feel also theater has to be kind of reflect that global stage we are in, and it actually has done that I think for over decades, but it's not as visible. And all the theater that's already being done in the Bronx and Staten Island and Queens and uh, any, everywhere up in Harlem, it's not as visible and not so supported. If I'm right per head in the Bronx, you get four or five dollars uh, cultural subsidies in Manhattan, it's 60 or to $65. So it tells you a story. So uh, maybe a little bit, um, uh, we start with you again. Um, I know you just started, but if somebody would say to you, hey, you guys at the Federal Theater, participate, so show something, what you do, maybe also host something, what would you be interested in and what would you say what has a festival to offer you to get you excited to feel like that is something we we would like to be part of it what is 
what would you need? Um, I have to say that listening to you about festivals, it makes me review what has been done in the past. Just to look what has happened in the past to guide us toward what's happening in the future. That makes any sense. Yeah. And some years ago, I think it was in the 90s, there was a young woman named Jacqueline Wade. She was quite ahead of her time. And she had a women of color festival. She had nothing but this dream and an idea. And that young woman went to every venue in New York City and there was work done. You just got space, spaces all over the city. That's one prototype. You go to festivals, or there's the Fringe Festival, the Solo Festival, uh, the Under the Radar Festival. They are now housed, and everybody on the panel, please correct me if I'm uh, it, it, wrong with facts. Uh, they are housed under one umbrella. Then you go to something like the National Black Theater Festival in Winston-Salem that started 20 years ago, and it's every two years. And they invite people from all over the country and all over the world to come to say, uh, Winston Salem, North Carolina. And it has changed the landscape of the entire state as hundreds of thousands of people have gone there. So those are, and I think of La Mama, Ellen Stewart and her their legacy that she has left, Mia, continuing to tap into this international, artistic, global family. And uh, this is the things that come to my mind. And I, in uh, 1999, started something called Going to the River, which was a festival of, of first initially Black and then women of color, playwrights. It was just festival, I think of a bandara, a feast, <laughs> a lot of work all happening at the same time, uh, happening all over the uh, city. And Ellen, it would happen in Hutt, and, and, and maybe in Maine, <laughs> and, and, and in the Apple uh, upstate, you know, all over, and here, all over. And now you're even introducing, I guess, all of these international companies, in addition to American companies and national companies, white, black, all colors to come. And, and I, I could only say a bandera, a bandara, which is feast, is a delicious and wonderful idea. So mm -hmm. I would say, how can I be a part of it? <laughs> Fantastic. And you think, sense. <laughs> yeah, you think also for the coalition, it would be something of interest to host some international people, but also show their own work. I think it would be something to explore. Sure. Yeah. Niall, what do you think? What comes to your mind? Um, when I think about what a successful theater festival might look like in the 21st century or in 2022, I think like you it would have to be artist driven, I really think. I think that what we learned during our pandemic was so many institutions were speaking to listening to artists and trying to let artists steer the ship in regards of how we could create an ecosystem that was really sustainable for artists to participate in. And I think that a festival of a new festival for the city would have to, I think, approach it in the same way. I think that something that's been really exciting to see this summer and it wasn't contextualized as a festival was the city's artist corps program where they're giving out grants to artists of $5,000 to do public interventions across the city. And in a way that was a festival in a way, um, maybe we may have not have thought about it as such, but giving artists $5,000 to, you know, do what they will with it and to collaborate with different venues across the city, make permitting a lot easier to get public space, to do interventions. And I think that's a really interesting way of thinking about um, programming. 
And then how we might intersect internationality into that is thinking about how we can really create spaces for collaboration of maybe curators putting together artists who from different countries. Oh, I know Niles work from New York. I think he would really love so-and-so from Lithuania and bringing them together for a discriminate small residency at PS2, uh, PS21 to come to a new work and to premiere it in the city um, for a summer. Because I feel like, you know, there's not a lot of, you know, what I think is great about festivals is you get to see a lot of work from all across the world, but there is not a lot of opportunities for international artists to come together to create new work together. So if we could find some sort of infrastructure for that, if institutions are housing residencies to bring artists, international artists together to make a new work for a festival in the city later in the summer. That would be something as an artist that I would be so thrilled to participate in. And, you know, I work very site responsively as an artist and, you know, being paired with another artist from across the world would be really exciting for me to make something new that maybe I would not have made um, with the suite of collaborators that I work with here in the city. So that's something that I think would be really exciting for me is um, to think about how we could bring our international artists together to create new work um, and really leading and letting artists steer the ship in regards of how they want their work to be presented. Mm -hmm. Well, these are these are really, both of you. What you said this is very significant and uh, and something we 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 really would agree on. Um, and Kristen, you have done a lot. You have seen a lot. What comes to your mind? Well, um, I also ran a summer festival for nineteen years. <laughs> so, yeah. I, but but I want to build on what we said. Like the history. Like there there was a lot in the summer at one point in the city. There was Lincoln Center. There was my festival, the American Living Room. There was the French Festival. There was uh, the Midtown Theater Festival. The Solo Festival came later. Music Theater Festival came later. There, there, there has been this, but I think the thing that happens in other cities in the summer, and particularly in Europe, is that there's this really exciting, decentralized, ex like opportunity to see a huge range of work. And it's not just one person's vision. And I really building on Nile, like think it'd be awesome for it to be completely decentralized. And I also thought there was a lot of exciting things happening this summer because of that city artist court fund. And I think that a lot of organizations started to work outside because of COVID and my organization included, we did a ton of work outside in the last year and we hadn't done as much of that. And we did it in all five boroughs. And there are audiences that you're reaching that you don't reach when they have to walk into the door of an institution. And I think that's a really exciting opportunity is to invite people to participate who don't think they like art or don't necessarily go to art. And then they discover it in, in their backyard, in their home, in their park, in their in front of their courthouse, like wherever, wherever you build that. Um, I think that there's a real hunger that people have and a curiosity when they have the opportunity to participate for free. And that that would be a really essential part, I think, to really welcome New York City um, to come to the work. Yeah, that, I, I think it's a fundamental, so artist-driven um, public spaces. People who normally don't go, don't come yet, um, or don't think theater is for them. So, but uh, Elena, you have strong ideas also how it should not be you know what you feel is wrong um you are where you what is your background your cultural continental background where you're from and so you're looking also a bit from the outside of new york where you have worked so long i grew up in the former soviet union um uh, and i came here as a student first in, um, to be in college and then graduate school and i stayed and have worked here ever since so I, I'm not so much as an immigrant, but as you would, one would say, gastarbeiter in the cultural sphere. And um, yes, the, only reason, <laughs> the only reason I mention my background is that it does inform very strongly my ideas and especially progressive ideas of access and how one thinks about uh, creating access for as, as large a number of people as possible. But I mostly want to say how much, how strongly I agree with my colleagues Elizabeth and Kristen about uh, the importance of decentralization, where people from the zip code 121 will take a subway, public transportation to Far Rockaway, to the Bronx, um, to Queens, to experience all kinds of work and to, um, um, you know, since Frank, you mentioned Festival de Ton, they present all over the town, right? And they present in all kinds of boroughs in Paris. 
some which you really have to take to take quite a long subway ride to get to. Um, in a place like MC, I think 93 it's called, one of those Maison de Culture, the palaces of culture that André Malraux built. And, and I, I, I'm not sure I remember the, his, the quote correctly, but he really was trying to build um, as, uh, th this kind of points of access where everybody, everyone, regardless of where uh, their background, um, it, the, the aim was to offer to everybody the experience of culture or tempting experience of culture wherever they are, just to give them a taste. So that's a, a crucial aspect, that the decentralization. The second one, it seems to me, um, when we speak about access, is what Kristen already pointed out, uh, affordability. The, the, the meaning of the festival is people celebration, getting together. So the affordability of tickets, whether free or um, very affordable, which is really not the case with any of the recent festivals, as much as we like Lincoln Center Festival, that's really not the festival that was uniformly affordable to many people. So that, that is an extremely important aspect. Um, the third one is actually drawing people in and distributing tickets um, to certain population groups. I know I sound um, like I come from a socialist space where there's suddenly a distribution of tickets, but hey, why not? <laughs> you know, to certain kinds of uh, population groups who, as Christian said, may not think that it is for them. Um, and of course, concomitant with this kind of festival spirit is a creation of public space and a discussion and a forum where you can freely discuss ideas, your impressions, and a hangout space. Um, try to have a drink at the Lincoln Center Plaza, if you have a drink, with you or somehow. They, 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 you cannot stay at the Lincoln Plaza, it's privately owned. So the diminishment of public space, even to spend time, which is affordable, is, an, is, is a, I think in New York City is a huge problem. The underutilization of public spaces and parks. Um, just like what Kristen mentioned, one of the um, initiatives we had in the Hudson Valley, because we are also overwhelmed by the, this exodus of wealthy New Yorkers and gentrification in the Hudson Valley, we took our international circus productions to town parks where people are. And they are, the town park is 10 minutes from us, but there were a lot of families who would never come to our space. And we decided that this kind of conceptual circus is in the way certain companies work, which is very much embedded in the community and where the work is very much based in the idea of working with, you know, the nature of work is, is mm -hmm. that, not the, the product, the show that you come and uh, present and then you leave. But let's say a theatrical participatory in installation is one of the circus ideas we are bringing next summer. Um, so those are all sort of festival ideas from the type yeah. and nature of work to um, you know affordability of spaces. Yeah, and a lot of spaces, parks, uh, you know, parking lots uh, everywhere around. David. Um, um, tell us a little bit, uh, uh, what's in your mind? You've been a curator, you worked a lot with the Foundry Theater with Melanie Joseph um, on a great project that really also reflect on the city. What comes to your mind when you hear a festival? Well, the thing that interests me is, well, let me start from maybe a premise that the rest of the panel may not share, which is for me, there's a lot of opportunities in New York to see work um, that artists are presenting from around the world. I mean, even if you just look at the the legacy institutions, the larger institutions, the Shed, the Park Avenue Armory, um, the Performing Arts Center that's going to happen downtown, BAM, um, there's a lot of opportunities to see work. So what interests me the most, I have to say, um, and I'm not doctrinaire about this, maybe it's my own peculiar interest, is the opportunity for artists and audiences to train and to study. Uh, and when I say study, I mean basically people getting together to kind of figure shit out. You know, it doesn't have to be a kind of curriculum. And for those of you like myself who have been in and worked at universities, you know that actually getting together with your peers to kind of figure shit out is one of the hardest things to do at a university, right? Because the university is about a kind of certain professional certification. 
uh, assorting um, assignments and such. Sorry, I'm in a hotel room and not in my home and my computer is on a ironing board. So that's yeah. why it's thank you here. Um, so I'm really interested in, in what the festival uh, opportunities the festival can offer artists to study. And so, I mean, I guess, Frank, I'll say one thing, which is like, I am maybe less compelled by the model of Avignon or Theatre de Velp than I am in um, something like the Prague Quadrennial, right, which is devoted to design and scenography in this kind of very broad European sense. So the question I asked myself is, what would, could we focus on in New York? And what I see my peers asking each other and trying to figure out on their own is, how can we be workers? How can we change the industry so that it aligns with our values? What levers do we have and to pull? And what ways do we have to organize? And maybe rather than thinking about what work can artists bring to the city, a question we could ask is, what do artists need to learn? Who can they study with? Because the people at, at you know, um, Hunts Point Produce in the Bronx, you know, they know how to seize power. We saw that in January 21, where they had a, a six day strike. You know, the teachers, they know how to organize and how to struggle, right? Uh, strike MoMA and the movement for Palestinian lives just kind of centered in Sunset Park. Those people know how to fight. So maybe the, maybe the opportunity for the festival is less, what can we bring to the city, but what can we learn um, from the people, you know, engaged in their work, in their habits of assembly, in their, more, their forms of study? Mm -hmm. So that was a kind of contrarian take, but that's really what's on my mind. No, no, no. I think that that is all, all, all very, very, very significant point. Let me also repeat what we heard a little bit um, um, throughout the day. I think the, the idea of we had a panel with CUNY theaters. We have about 21 theaters uh, uh, into CUNY or 25. We're the largest theater system actually in the nation, but it's not visible. There's very little money. It's completely underfunded like every public institution. They're struggling for survival there. Most of them are closed. Only Lehman College uh, is going to open up. We learned today because they were lucky to get a big grant. Um, so they said um, we have to activate these public spaces. Artists should not drop in and then, you know, drop out, like come like to a to a, a tourist destination, you know, where you fly in in a gated community and then you leave two days later. Artists should stay. They should engage. They should, things should slow down, collaborate, what Niall said, you know, with local people and create something together new. Artists as curators also was said, it, said it should be really a lot about refugees, about uh, immigrants, that the stories that we need to hear now so we um, uh, deal with problems that are in front of us. Also people who never go to this theater, how we can reach them it has to be affordable. Big theme was families, kids, uh, theater for kids, for teenagers, uh, people who, a family now it wants to go with two or three kids and grandpa to a Broadway show or somewhere, it will cost them six or eight hundred dollars tickets, transportation, if they go out and eat something. It's impossible. That's why nobody goes. And these audience are significant. And uh, as everybody said, you know, the workers, the ones who are celebrated in the hospitals, the bus drivers, the people in the stores who stack the shelves, where's their access to the arts? Where are the stories they can look at or they can celebrate life and be part of that? Um, kind of uh, civilized world we all uh, dream about. Um, the other said it should really feature artists from neighborhoods also. That's important. People who live there, you know, should also show their work and they see them later um, on the streets. And then we also should have small works, not just the big Bolshoi ballet flying in, but the idea of small works and small spaces that are significant in countries and continents all around the world. And there is a lot. Um, what we um, what we are missing. So, um, what do you think uh, um, uh, would be uh, a big mistake? What should be avoided? Um, you know, what what it would be the wrong thing at the moment to do, but what might be tempting? And uh, I think uh, Elena spoke a little bit uh, um, to it. But what what do you feel is of urgency and what should not be done. I'm, I'll open it up to everybody. What should we be afraid of in case theater fully starts again? My sarcastic answer is a single white man curating it. That's my, that's yeah. my, my flip answer for you, but nobody's yeah, going to do that. Yeah. And that's a big answer. And that's an important answer. You know, like this prelude also, we had this chain curation. We had 12 curators for 12 works. 
it was fantastic the mixture the diversity and also the surprises but it's risky and it's not we are not in control really we give up but it's i i love i loved it it's so vibrant it's so great but this is a good a really good point not someone in charge and i think niall's point that artists should be in charge I um, very much want to continue what David brought up, where um, the kind of forum that a festival would uh, provide is really a forum for maybe dissent and the creation of and and um, the kind of breaking of structures and the elucidation of what um, what impedes um, equity access. I don't want this festival to be another kind of new NYC Go opportunity with a generous funding from the Bloomberg Foundation and a few other big foundations and then going as business as usual, where, um, where the action, this event uh, is funded generously, but the actual conversation and how we work stays the same. So that I think is to be avoided. Mm. I have a question for you, Elena. Do you think an institution has the capacities to actually facilitate something like that? The institutions themselves, they don't have financial capacities, no. But the institutions and artists and other actors in this so-called industry or community do um, just what David said about teachers organizing. There is a, There is a... There, there are examples of the kind of community building and resistance building that that if we are not an institution or a single person but coming together as a community that i think we can do um, a lot more than what was done before i think something that came up in a conversation that frank and i had with some other presenters was a, an idea of thinking about okay you have a Manhattan set, and even in Manhattan, you have different subsets that are kind of representing their communities. And then you have Queens, and you have a set of Queen presenters, and then people that are working in smaller communities in Queens. And so that there's a lot of independence, but there can also be some dialogue and conversation about how you might influence each other and feed off each other and build off each other in an interesting way. Yeah. Really, that we also perhaps even tour a piece within the boroughs. You know, the Brooklyn is the fifth largest city of the United States. You know, it's a city, actually. You know, and often something that's been shown you know, never, never even goes there. Will never be seen. It doesn't touch it. A little bit for you and the fifty theaters you collaborate with. Um, um, what do you feel? What what for? Let's say everybody of these theaters would be asked to be a part of it. What do you think what they would like to do? What would be helpful, what would be inspiring? What would energize them? I'm thinking. Yeah, that's good. I'm thinking. I wanna ask David and Ellen, Elena a question about you're, you're talking about dissent. Can you ex explain that a little bit or uh, banding together to, would you explain that? I'm just curious. I, I just wanna explore that, where that's going. That's, if you don't mind, is that all right, Frank? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Elena, would you like to speak? I'm happy to. Wait, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I think, you know, in here, I'm really just following the thought of, you know, the, the Black Studies scholar and poet Fred Moten and his collaborator, Stefano Harney. When I say that, for me, any kind of dissent, any kind of comportment against the institution. So if we're striking, you know, Broadway, let's say, which I'm not saying people should, but if we are, I think that 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 orientation toward the institution is really thought of as a defense, a protective layer against what I think is really important, which are practices of sharing and solidarity and ways of getting together 
and ways of coming together um, that are not privatized and conditioned by by capital, um, by the need to work. So for me, I'm I'm less interested maybe primarily in dissent as in a kind of like um, reacting to what you know a, a part a party is doing, whether it's the public theater or the city of New York or related companies, the developer, than I am in kind of how can we work within but also outside of the institutions that we call the theater, which is really the theater industry. How can we all get together? And 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 by all I mean, you know, communities who share values, who have a vision for the world, who have questions they want to pursue together. How can they get together and not be waiting for um, a larger institution to give them the green light? So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's really how I um, have been thinking about it. Do you, do you feel that smaller institutions are waiting for big institutions to give them the green light? No, not necessarily. I mean, I, I've um, certainly in my own work, I've tried to be you know proactive and forthright and tried to create fair working conditions, try to advance anti-racist imperatives. But I think, um, uh, so no, I don't, I, this is not me saying that, well, smaller institutions are incapable of doing those things. Um, but I if, think that- Yeah, if, if I understand right from your question, but also from the answers, we can also see that Perhaps the festival that it should not be feeding the machine, the big entertainment machine, the Netflixes, the kind of sugar industry, you know, of the, you know, of everything is fine. We should go ahead. There are real problems in this I world, that, in this country. And the festival should, you know, highlight it, should be supportive of finding solutions and show, show it what, what is there. And it's not just, we are great. We love New York, the big slogan, you know. Uh, New York is great, and let's get started. And also to say, no, we have to, what theater has done over thousands of years, problems of a society, of a city, or personal problems is being shown on stages, and you think about it in a way that hopefully it changes your mind, it changes your thinking. You haven't seen something. So I think that I would see it in that way that a festival is really contributing towards uh, understanding the world and seeing it in a new way. I think so, well, I'll say one more thing. Just, Elizabeth's answer, one second. So it, it just sounds like he was talking about uh, maybe new forms. But when we get back to uh, what you're articulating, Frank, I just simply don't see new federal theater, one of the oldest black theaters in the country, that exist because there was no place for us mm -hmm. to exist and a place which created for us and the coalition of theaters of color, which are an array of ethnicity and races. Mm -hmm. I don't see us doing art that comes out of that place. Our art comes out of a place of, of our history, of our, of our ancestors, of our struggles, of our triumphs, of our inequities, of our love. I just simply don't see, I don't see commercialism or, or capitalism. <laughs> it's not a reason why I exist. It's not a reason why I create. And that would be not anything that I would, that would not, we're going to, we're artists. The six people I'm looking at on this panel, I have no fear that your creations, your art is going to inform, uplift, enlighten, broaden, because that's who we are. We're not the commercial, we're not doing this for money. I'm not. Uh, I hope I'm making. I yeah. hope I'm no, no, that's making sense. You do. May I ask a question back, though, Elizabeth? Sure, sure. Which is, um, have you received any government support or funding uh, due to COVID? And the reason I ask this question is the following: um, We may say that we are not dependent on the environment and capitalism, this or that. Um, 
during COVID, when there was a conversation, it will never be the same. We will start anew. It will change. What really struck me so much is um, how quickly we got back to so-called normal, not normal. How quickly and seamlessly. And how um, very uh, glad all kinds of organizations were upon the receipt of funding. Some extremely comfortable funding, just like large organizations. And the higher, as you may know, your earned income was, meaning the more tickets you sold at higher prices, the more money you would have received. The more seats you had bringing wonderful commercial productions produced with European funding, selling a lot of tickets for much higher cost than they actually uh, anywhere in Europe. That's probably the region I know the best. Um, and how absolutely okay the situation was for a lot of people who work in this industry. And whether we think um, we um, are independent of that, I, I'm, not, I'm actually not so sure. So when I mentioned the word of dissent, it really was part of that place of assembly that David was bringing up of how can we create a forum for the discussion of how we can actually affect um, a real change structurally. Right, and I, and, and I would have, that's why I wanted to explore deeper for clarity for, so I understood what you were saying in a deeper way. Mm -hmm. uh, but we make no mistake, we are nonprofit and we seek grants. And there's a great inequity in those grants, a great inequity that that's right, that we have been facing before COVID, after COVID. <laughs> so that hasn't. Hmm. So, and I felt that where you were going and where David was going was deconstructing form, that we were going to do something new and different that was not, quote, a Broadway structured form. So that's why I was exploring the question. Mm -hmm. But I don't in any way want to say that we are independent of philanthropy. Kristen, yeah. for you, how is it for you and your art center? Um, do you feel there's something very really different the way you are funded, um, that the, everybody said we should support artists. You're one of the few institutions that hosts so, so, so many residencies. Do you have more funding? Is it getting better? Or do you say, this has to change, I'm upset, it didn't work out as I was promised? Um, I think that it, there was a lot, I, I wanna touch back in on a couple of the points that yes. were raised to pull them in. I mean, I just feel like we, we learned a lot in COVID about how to be more humane and how to be more caring for each other and how to stop being such um, um, unfair, inequitable and uh, greedy field and how to stop mistreating each other in this field. Um, and we also, at the same time, had a racial reckoning that has been present for theaters of color and for artists of color, but it was not present enough for white people. And there's that is bringing back different thinking. Um, but my fear is that that's not that that's not being carried forward. That my fear is that that people are going back to business as usual, and they're going back to like, oh, we're going to do 10 out of 12s. We're going to work six days a week. We're going to like pay people unevenly, you know, like that people really haven't taken that message and interiorized it for their practice, that they pay lip service to it without the practice of it. And um, the practice is hard and daily and needs to be happening in our field. For us to be a place that's truly welcoming artists of all different backgrounds, a place that's welcoming audiences of all different backgrounds, if we really think about the theater um, playing a role in community, we need to really self-examine what that means in terms of our own practices. So I just um, want us to go slow and careful and caring um, as we go forward. Um, and at the same time to um, open the doors as widely as possible and go outside as much as possible and really have conversations and listen. 
And I think that's also what both David and Elena were talking about in terms of listening to what's already happening, not be the ones that we're setting the table, but how can we learn how to set our table? Um, so I'm thinking about those things. Hmm. Niall. Um, I really agree with what Kristen said. I think that it was really interesting to hear the sort of this discussion kind of turn around the sort of definition and our understandings of dissent and what that means. And I feel like, you know, the coalition of theaters that Elizabeth are working with know dissent very well and know fugitivity very well from their, you know, from their cultural histories of trying to, you know, survive in predominantly white, you know, spaces and trying to create their art. So um, I think it's, um, I think that it's two halves of the coin approaching dissent, but I, I think it's a beautiful conversation. And I think that why, why I asked Elena earlier around if an institution can actually hold space for a dissenting festival that is rebelling against institutions. I'm like, is that, how does that actually work out? Um, but um, it's an interesting question nonetheless. Um, but that's all I have to say. Yeah, I, I like this idea, the notion that it's a place where you learn something. You're not entertained, you know, though you have something before or after. It's a place where you learn and create something together. And I like, you know, what Niall also said, that artists have to be in charge. Um, there are studies that suggest more money is spent on the arts in the United States, buying uh, paintings, uh, giving money to artists, galleries, big symphonies, big museums. You know, of course, it's highly, highly, you know, uh, on the side where we, we don't agree with this, but um, no artists are really in charge or part of it. As far as I know, Lincoln Center, as the entity altogether, has 85 or 90 board members. Everybody, we all could be board members and we pay $350,000. We could be one tomorrow, but there are no artists involved. You know, I don't know how many of them talk to artists. The time when Leonard Bernstein and uh, Leah Kazan, Balanchine, and uh, Jerome Robbins were there and were running it in a way. You know, I think that that is that's not there. And um, also, uh, how many people, how many artists really are board members in the boards of also the, what David calls the nonprofit industrial theater complex? You know, um, I think here Art Center is a big uh, uh, different organized that way and most probably Elizabeth and her theaters are also but a lot of them are not and it's you know non-profits you know moved into Broadway mode with their plays and subscriptions and pleasing audience having big things and you know people who look at money or understand money and study business whatever are in charge for decisions and not artists and or and so I think an important thing really is also the oops the participation of artists um um, in a festival to be in charge and um, and our little festival as small as it is and it's also free you know showed something is possible and it sets energy free and connects people so we have to we, we have to find a way but one how can that be really done for such a big city it's a big big question how to organize it you know I just heard this morning we got an email. Someone said that Lincoln Center is putting together a, a We Are Back in New York festival and they are asking 40, 50 organizations all around the city to participate. I don't know, did any one of you get an invitation or? No. Um, so it's supposed to be, it's a very large outreach, um, um, celebrate New York City, but it's a New York festival. I haven't also heard uh, um, about it, but it will be interesting to see what the ideas are, what they want to do, and um, and if they have such discussions as as we ha we have um, we have now. What do you think would be pragmatic steps to take to towards such a festival, and how how could we be respectful to all what we said today um, in in the creation of an, a first edition of it? I don't know, maybe a symposium or something or getting people together and... I guess I'll just say briefly, I mean, I think there is a real appetite in the field. Um, and by the field, you know, maybe I, I have a very small perspective on it from my peer group in New York City and the Northeast maybe, but for different leadership structures. I mean, you're seeing it at 
different levels of the field. And, you know, certainly in smaller institutions and in independent institutions, um, and Elizabeth, I really love what you said about history. You know, a real lotus star for me is Amiri Baraka and the Black Art School and then Spirit House that he developed in, in Newark, which were kind of shared leadership models. So, I mean, one question, or I guess one beginning question, uh, Frank, that I think about is like, what would leadership and maybe to borrow Adrian Marie Brown's language, a leader full uh, festival look like? Um, and how could that itself, in some sense, be be an artwork, um, a thing that, you know, is is an experimentation, is a um, has its own kind of aesthetic sociality to it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the way it's organized already has to be different in order to be truthful, you know. You all maybe remember the recent, um, um, the kind of a running list, a spreadsheet, which was anonymous, where museum workers could contribute um, their position and then the salary and compensation and how many years they worked in the field. Um, I'm bringing this up for two reasons. First is completely unrelated, which is um, how when we speak about um, ways of changing structures, the, the, the issue of incredibly inequitable compensation where the management is emulating, the, the compensation of the management emulates the corporate model in America where the management of large institutions is compensated very highly. And then the people who do the actual work can barely make a living in New York City. But um, the reason I brought up structurally this spreadsheet is that there is a way to actually have a democratic quorum of how you think you can invite people to contribute ideas and participate. And that's just the immediate thought that comes to mind that can run where you collect ideas. Now the technology allows this um, and then the next step, I don't know, but that's that's up for discussion, thinking, mm -hmm. exchange. So, so a forum where people can suggest ideas. It's like the open space model, the open space when you have gatherings and the agenda is made by the people who are there in that moment. Yeah. And then they, and then they self select where they want to go, and it's truly non-hierarchical and truly welcoming all perspectives of those present. Yeah. Yeah, and I heard that some salaries, you know, whatever, I don't know, the shed or other, I mean, it's out of this world if that's really true, you know, and I, I, I know the head electrician at the Metropolitan Opera, I think it's 1.5 million a year, if that's true. I don't know, um, it, but it's just uh, something that is really, the inequity couldn't be higher you know, in these like, kind of institutions and um, compared to the work and instead of supporting also existing theaters. And, um, but I think the idea of an open space gathering, um, I, 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 I think that's something. So you mean, Kristen, it should be people meet in a big hall or is it online or um, how, how do we do that? Uh, when I've attended those sort of events, they've always been in person, but that was before the pandemic. So I suppose there might be a model that could be in Zoom, but I don't know if that would be as interesting because a lot of the interesting things that happen is maybe one-on-one -on -one when you're standing there trying to figure out where to go. But you, I mean, there's certainly the technology to do it online that could welcome people from all over the world instead of just people who happen to be in New York City and available. But I don't know. You could, okay. There are different ways you could tackle it. Yeah, it's it's such a big, uh, just a big, um, a big questions. Um, what are festivals you guys went to? What do you remember? What do you like? What did you like about it? I'm a little bit you're mute. I like the array of plays and events and art that I could see. I liked interacting with the people, seeing people from all over the country, all over the world, artists from all over the world. Uh, that was exciting to me. Panel discussions, interactions, 
coffee with people, meeting new people, seeing extraordinary work. That was exciting. Mm -hmm. Kristen, what is the greatest festival you went to, and what, or you, the ones you did? I don't know. You did so much, you know. Also, but what, what do you, what, what do you remember? What worked? Uh, I think what Elizabeth just said about the, the the festivals that have been the most fun is 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 when there's this range of work that you can engage in, and there's stuff happening at all different times of day, and it's really hard to choose because there's so many exciting things happening and you run into somebody and they just say, Oh, I just saw this. This is amazing. You need to see it. And so you change your program and you go to over to that instead. You know, I just think it's that, it's that buzz of energy that um, real excitement about engaging with each other can be created in the festival. Um, I think that happens here in New York in the winter um, with all of our festivals happening in January, you know, it's, there's and everybody coming in from out of town to see the festivals that we're doing and, I think that that's a really exciting time in New York for that reason. And even though it's cold and we can't gather outside, we've managed to find the little pockets to talk to each other and to get excited about new things to go see. Yeah. Now, do you remember a festival where you went, any kind of? Um, I've had such great times at festivals, um, but I agree, again, agreeing with Elizabeth's ethos that a great festival is made of amazing people and amazing work. Um, I had a question for Kristen, but her curiosity that as you spoke to APAP season and the whole January winter moment of as a community, if it was still a good idea to be putting so much stake on so many stakeholders coming together during the deepest part of winter, which will present the, the greatest challenges for COVID and, you know, coming together indoors is already so challenging. And I was curious if you had any thoughts about if it was, a, and what is interesting about this panel of thinking about the summertime is, is it still a great moment for us to be putting so much of our energies towards a, a collaborative effort in the deepest part of winter? Yeah, I mean, we all, we obviously, we did a virtual festival last year, like um, some people didn't do festivals at all, other people did virtual. Um, and we are meeting, we meet regularly the January festivals and we're all going forward with a with, with in-person festival and we're all gonna have some hybridity, we're all gonna have some digital stuff, um, but nobody has decided to just do digital this year. Everyone's so hungry to be able to, um, the artists whose work we were making for, for 21 to be able to bring it for 22 and not push them to 23. Um, but I also think that, you know, I, I can certainly say in prototypes case, the work definitely changed. You know, um, we were doing um, one of our here productions that's in prototype is uh, Taylor Max The Hang, um, which Matt Ray is doing the music for. And that, that project has really changed because the piece is about um, this opportunity to gather and these precious moments and to enjoy each other's company and to slow down and engage. And it's this jazz, relaxed jazz piece with an incredible ensemble of folks. And that piece, the meaning of the piece really changed because of COVID. And um, it feels really like it's, it's, this, it's right for this moment. And the artists have revised the piece for this moment in response. So I feel um, excited um, and certainly really nervous um, but I, I do feel um, it's really great that we're down to like 1.4% here in New York City um, in terms of infection rate. And I, I just, I have hopefulness. I'm afraid there's going to be an Ernesto and a, a Frank and a Griffin and a, you know, all these variants to come. But I, I feel like um, guardedly optimistic, I guess, that we can find a way to exist together safely. Yeah, Elena. For you, for festivals, what 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 do you or what type or or what what do you feel as a model could work from your travels? Mm, the most favorite spot for me was Fira Tarega in a small town outside of Barcelona. It's the largest festival of and market for international contemporary circuit and street arts, and that's really a model of the most democratic um, kind where the highest ticket price is 10, 15 euros, but most productions are free of charge. They start at 2 p.m. and they end at midnight and it's dispersed all over the city. It's incredibly accessible. 
um, uh, staying there and accommodation, um, the, the festival makes sure that whomever comes to the festival, whether it is a guest from a presenter from abroad, although I have to say, if it were not for our small US group that was organized by Toho in Montreal, there were actually no other American presenters. And that amazes me because it's a festival that is incredibly accessible and that gives uh, a sense in, uh, of what a festival could be um, for the most kind of democratic access uh, for families, especially. And that one was probably my most favorite. And then just recently, I returned from Festival Noia Dramatique in Schaubonne. And what um, Im impressed me so in much. Berlin, in Berlin, Schaubonne. Berlin, Berlin, right. Uh, um, the, the, it's interesting how the urban space itself, that, that brilliant constructivist Erich Mendelssohn, who created Schaubonne as a multifunctional urban space, uh, it's all about public space. So you can actually connect with artists, connect with each other at all hours and many hours after the performance. The canteen with underboiled potatoes is open late. The prices are accessible and it's not four times higher to buy a glass of wine the way we have in our institutions when we go to even, you know, APAP or, or ISPA whenever in January we go to, to see stuff. Uh, it's a bit too expensive to hang out. And that's, that was a different, <laughs> and converse if you want to buy a, a drink or, or, or a bite to eat. And so that aspect, and I, I leave aside the, the actual wonderfulness of what I've seen at Festival Noa Dramatique, but I am just relating my, my um, impressions of the environment and the vibe. Yeah, that, that, that space is open and affordable. I think Chris Myers, who was one of the Siegel talks, that he was acting at the public, but he couldn't afford to eat in the restaurant. He was an actor in it. And he said, you know, how can that be? Something is fundamentally um, um, wrong in these places, theaters. We had, you know, the Gorky Theater, um, I think, in, in, um, from Sarah Brandikoff, who said, our doors are open in the morning from nine o'clock. It's a cafe all the actors come out and hang out after the shows. Uh, people come, students come. It, it's a, a working restaurant, but it's true. Try to do that. Even in La Mama, you, it's tough to get a coffee, you know, uh, downstairs, even though there is space, and it's hard to understand why. So I think this also might be something of festival atmosphere that makes you feel at home in this space where you are. I mean, we won't be able to solve all the problems and come with, uh, up with everything. It's kind of a starting of a dialogue, we feel. It's something in the beginning, and we at the Siegel Center, we're really thinking what is the most, the best use of our time and our tiny resources, the years going forward, and perhaps it will be less inside the university. And one of the ideas is really to say, to contribute to the idea of a um, of a, of a global festival, but also discussions take place where researchers share their work, students, people come. So I think this is something we want to do. It's a big, big, big radical change for us. And uh, we are still rethinking that, but I think it's something we can and want to. We would need all your help. And outside, I like the idea um, to have a big gathering, actually a global gathering, you know, say from people, we hear from people from everywhere, as Africa, Australia, Asia, say, what would we like? Um, maybe we should put together a council of 10 artists in New York, 10 theater artists, you know, and put them in charge of things and, um, and see. And we start small with a small festival that can also slowly grow and involves the park. Nothing has to, everything has to happen in the first time. But I think um, in the time you live in, the time of Trump, which we somehow survived, that showed us what is possible. I think art has to take a stand. We have to be out there. It's a forum of um, um, uh, of a discussion that's public and it's better than hopefully um, um, anti-vaxxer demonstrations or pro-gun demonstrations. It's more fun. It's more interesting. It's on the side of life, and um, and we learn something and we understand people's life. And I think we art has to take a stand. It is if New York City wants to go forward, it needs the arts. It needs to learn from the artists, and we maybe have to help to provide a space. I believe only the arts really. Uh, will save this city, make it again a, a city of culture, what it's known for, and it shouldn't go on the way it was, uh, as we also said, that institutions are in charge. Well, ultimately, then it's about money or filling their own seats, so we have to find a new model. I don't really know how to do it. Um, I would need help um, for that, or we would need help. We all, if we 
decide on that idea and uh, so it's a, a beginning this day to day with the three uh, talks we had, but I think there is interest and um, also caution, I think, uh, but there's also a lot of experience and love uh, for the city and for the art. So hopefully we might be able to put something together. We'll see. I want to thank you really for taking the time. It's our concluding uh, panel. I thought it is um, important to have such a discussion also at the very end to look a little bit ahead and see what influx influence you know artists curators public theaters as the cuny theaters are in a way and also these international organizations we spoke with the goethe french cultural services asia society you know what what they can bring in and um and i think at least these are encouraging um smoke signals again thanks for howl round um, for hosting us um it's a big honor to be there so thanks to thea and vj um, thanks to the Siegel team and the Tanvi Cactus Juice is sensational what they put together. We have our last presentation tonight. Miriam Bazid will show Faggy Fafi Cairo Boy and a play she wrote, you know, about um, um, the Arab American community and uh, the trans community struggling. She actually happens to be in London and it's going to be live stream from London with actors from over there. She is, he, she, they are not here. Um, and so that will be our uh, uh, final thing. And then um, hopefully in a couple of weeks from now, we'll have a prelude party and we have a space. And I would love for all of you to come. A little bit, you know, if you can make it. And Niall and uh, David, Elena comes in and Kristen, hopefully. So um, so we can continue the discussion. But we are serious about this. And, um, and so we can also all stay in contact um, with new ideas and new developments. Um, on that scene. So um, thank you all very much. I can't believe our festival in that sense is almost over, but this is a very important part and also uh, hopefully stands for the idea you all spoke about that we have to learn something and there has to be forums and discussions and understanding takes place, but also listening. So thank you all and uh, see you and to our listeners. Um, thank you. Thank you for taking out the time of your life. Uh, whoever listened in to whatever panels over the week, it means a lot to us, but it's also great for the artists and our participants to know there is an interest that people listen to it. So let them know in case you uh, saw them, heard them, and, um, and then you tell them and they hopefully tell us. So it's a democratic undertaking. Thank you all and goodbye. Stay safe.